G'day, I'm Ted. Welcome to Pig Face Point. Since 1985, we've been introducing visiting groups to what we call the simpler way. A present society is unsustainable and it's heading for breakdown. Our aim is to show why huge transition is essential and the kinds of alternative ways we must move to. These are the big global problems we face. The environment being damaged, resources dwindling, the third world not getting a fair share of the available resources, resource wars and a falling quality of life even in the richest countries. They're all due to far too much producing and consuming going on, causing far too much resource use. We have to transition to a simpler way. Less affluent lifestyles, self-sufficiency at the local and the personal level, cooperative society, mostly small local economies, degrowth and then no growth. And we need a society that's driven by need and not by profit. The box represents the resources produced in the world every year. And we've got seven, eight billion people on the planet. The resources are not distributed equally, are they? Let's rearrange the blocks so that they represent the way resources are actually consumed. The rich countries getting most of the resources, middle income countries, poor countries not getting much at all. And this many people don't have clean water and about as many are hungry all the time. And all the world's people will soon be about 10 billion. So it's quite obvious that there's no chance of everybody coming up to the level of resource use that we have in rich countries now. The footprint measure indicates that Australians use about seven hectares of productive land per capita. Now if we had 10 billion people, you'd need 70 billion hectares of productive land if everyone was going to live the way we do. But there are only 12 billion hectares of productive land on the planet, so everyone would only get 0.7 hectares, which is a, a tenth of what we're using. So that's just another way of showing that there's no chance of everyone living as resource affluently as we do now. This plot represents the distribution of consumption in the world, rich countries, middle income countries and poor countries. Now if we have 10 billion people and our GDP per capita increases at 3% per annum and all of the people come up to the level we would have by 2050, then the world would be producing 15 times as much stuff every year as it does now, which is of course quite impossible. So economic growth just makes everything so much worse. Many people realise this now, there's an increasing global degrowth movement where people realise that we have to get to an economic system that doesn't involve anything like as much producing, consuming and resource use as we have now. Many people believe that we can decouple economic growth from resource use. Now there are many big reviews and now find that that's not happening and it is not remotely likely to happen. This represents the growth of economic output and this represents the amount of producing and consuming of resources that's going on. The World Wildlife Fund is saying that for land resources, we really should be down here, that, that we're now nearly using twice as many land resources as is sustainable. Now, if we go to 2050, and GDP goes up there, we have no chance of reducing resource use to something like a half of its present use. Another major fault in this economy is that it allows market forces and production for profit to determine who gets things. Markets do some things well, but in a market system, the rich get most of what's available because they can pay more. 
As a result, millions of tonnes of grain are fed to animals every year, while millions are hungry. This is the situation this economy gets poor countries into. Developments defined as getting the economy going. So, the best land goes into export production and not producing food for local people. The tourist industry is encouraged, so very few jobs, low pay. The resources are sent to rich countries, the minerals or any oil, and again very low wages for a few and very poor royalty payments and they get left with the environmental damage. The fishing industry booms but the fish goes to the rich world and a lot of it into pet food. Now all of this development requires infrastructures and they are costly so loans have to be taken out to build dams and power stations. These city booms and the local elites do well because there are lots of opportunities for them to get in on the investment deals. Polarisation and class division increases and um, the rural sector gets neglected. So you end up with a lot of importing and exporting going on. They have to export heavily to pay off that debt from the loans that have been taken out. And that's great for us because we get the imports um, from them and uh, we can make money exporting to them. So conventional development results in development in the interest of the rich and development of the wrong things. In addition, conventional development results in a huge flow of wealth from poor to rich countries. Something like 15 times the amount of aid that flows in. Again, it does this because market forces and the profit motive are allowed to determine what happens. You and I couldn't have our high living standards unless this kind of development was happening. It's a grossly unjust global economy. It delivers most of the world's wealth to us. This economy inevitably generates enormous inequality. It works mainly for the rich. They're the ones who've got money to invest, which yields more wealth. Well, they don't have to do any work for it. The poor can't do that. Inequality inevitably increases. The red represents the distribution of world wealth. The poor don't get much of it. About Half of it is held by the richest 1%. How high would the red have to be to represent the wealth of the world's richest person? The answer is about 70 kilometres. To summarise our situation, we've got two enormous problems, faults built into this society. The first is that we've exceeded the limits to production and consumption that are sustainable. The second is that we have a grossly unacceptable global economy. Now those two faults are generating all the big global problems threatening now to destroy us. We have to move to far simpler lifestyles and systems. Before we start discussing alternative ways, let's have a quick look around our Pig Face Point site, where we've been since 1942. The house and shed built 1946. The view from that angle now. The view from the roof about 1950. That view now. Very poor soil. The only thing we could get to grow was pig face, hence the name Pig Face Point. Same view now, and from the northeast. Same angle now. This is Big Sam, the family pet black snake. One of the many big trees I planted long ago, and the big wetland.
Occasionally we get swans. This lot raised a family, a little yellow signets there. And very rarely we get pelicans. And sometimes everybody turns up. A bushfire danger, that's our house down the bottom there. And this one nearly got us, uh, burnt the doormat. This is our tea house where visitors have lunch and discussions. There are fairies and elves around here too. Some of them very helpful. Some just sit and think too much. Some are very clever. Some are just bone lazy and some are rather cheeky. We've got gremlins around here too. They're mischievous, they lose your tools, clog up your pot. You rarely see them, but... Now let's start looking at the form a satisfactory society would have to take. The only way we can defuse the big global problems we're facing is by transitioning to some kind of simpler way. And it would be very easy to do that if we wanted to do it. We've been arguing for this perspective for over 40 years. This book was published in 1985. There are four basic principles. The first is that most people would live in small, highly self-sufficient communities, producing most of the basic things they need from local resources and little firms and farms. Small communities are essential if we're going to get the resource consumption rates right down. For example, almost all food can come from within home gardens, community gardens, local commons and small farms not far from the town. Now that means you need very little transport, you need very little packaging or advertising and workers can get to work on foot or by bicycle. And what's most important is you can recycle food nutrients to the soils. You can't do that in big cities. So we wouldn't need sewers and we wouldn't need a fertiliser industry to provide most of our food. So it must be a localised world, not a globalised world. This indicates the scope for local sources of basic inputs. Earth for building, timber from the forest, uh, wool and animals on the pastures, lots of plant products, leather, feathers, blood and bone, fertiliser. And the materials feed into local industries, many little industries, little firms, um, basketry, lots of chemicals from plant materials, a food processing of course of many kinds, blacksmithing, clothing, sometimes using bolts of cloth brought into the local dressmaker, foundries for ceramics, uh, crockery, um, casting, uh, metal, metal tool making, and building, lots of building from local materials, especially earth, but also timber. Little firms like our pottery and kiln. This article on the supply of eggs explains why self-sufficient local communities are essential. Look at all the resource-intensive inputs that go into the production of a supermarket egg and bad conditions for animals in battery chicken factories, the packaging, advertising, storage that has to go into getting the eggs to the supermarket, then there's transport to the kitchen and waste from there too. But eggs from backyards or village co-ops involve very few of those inputs 
and have chickens in much better conditions and the waste go to the gardens. Our study found that the dollar and the energy cost of an egg from a supermarket was about a hundred times that of the backyard or village co-op egg. It would be much the same for many other items, many other food items, processing, clothing, carpentry, furniture. There's a lot of concern now to localise production. When we do, we'll stop this resource squandering nonsense. This is our model of a typical Sydney suburb. A lot of space given to the car. Not much gardening going on, growing of veggies in backyards. Nothing useful growing in the park. Parking lot, supermarket importing things. A derelict factory wasted site and basically a dormitory suburb, not a community. Well, let's remake this neighbourhood. We've dug up most of the roads, the petrol station becomes a community centre, one public swing pool rather than lots of private ones. Now there's a road we've dug up, community orchard in the front there, lots of vegetable gardens, animal pens. The park's got a pond for fish and useful plants, uh, fish tanks, and the old supermarket becomes a little business of some kind. The derelict factory is now a little market garden. A US eco-village has done these kinds of things and cut their resource consumption to 5% of the US average. At the household and neighbourhood level, we'd be using a lot of permaculture ideas. Lots of them in David Holmgren's book. Just outside the town, there'll be little farms, many of them just like this one, producing small amounts of stuff for the town and uh, making a small amount of income. There's a craft shed and a greenhouse, fish tanks and poultry at the back, um, an orchard further up, and nuts, olives, then there's veggies and two sheep for spinning and a cow that's rotated around three little farms grapevines, berries, tractor hired from the village co-op, vegetables, a fruit orchard, a pig and uh, ducks on the pond, uh, honey, beeswax and in the house room for holiday visitors to hire out. Britain imports a lot of its food, but this book finds that it could feed itself with only about 18% of its workforce on small farms. Agribusiness is very unsatisfactory, very resource costly and ecologically damaging. Small farms are far more efficient, even in dollar terms, and they can recycle nutrients because they're close to where the food scraps originate. Note that these are very different systems. We have to change systems, not just lifestyles. The second big principle is that these communities must be largely self-governing. The people who live there will have to make the decisions and implement them. This cannot be done by distant central governments. The people in the towns are the only ones who know the conditions, the history, the kind of people, the kind of soils. So they have to make the decisions that are suitable for their conditions. That can't be done by distant authorities. They have to feel it's their town. Their welfare depends on it running well and they have to be very conscious of that. So they have to be empowered, involved in activities and decision-making discussion. They have to be proud of their town. So we'll have town assemblies, which is participatory democracy. We rule ourselves, we make the decisions, we have to implement them through our working bees. There will still be a need for centralised states, but there won't be very much for them to do. They cannot keep their eye on millions of little communities and towns and make sensible decisions for them anyway. There'll be lots of voluntary committees and cooperatives They'll be providing lots of free goods for the community. 
and there's no need for paid bureaucrats. We'll have a lot of community property, commons, providing free food, materials, services and leisure. Our bridge is the kind of community property that we'd have fun making on working booze. Every neighbourhood should have a community centre, including a workshop, community tools to borrow, meeting place, coffee, library, craft areas, museum, art gallery. This is our workshop. Craft areas upstairs. And another of the commons every neighbourhood should have is the recycling area. This is ours. Plenty of good stuff to use on the next job. Now to the third basic principle. There must be a very different economic system. The basic unit must be the town economy which the people of the town control for the benefit of all. The economy must be geared to meeting needs, and that means it cannot be driven by market forces or profit. So the town discusses what it needs and takes appropriate action. Now I think most firms could be privately owned. I think they should be, because that's a nice thing to do, run your own little enterprise but they'd have to operate under strict social guidelines. Some goods would need to be imported, so we'd need some industries that export things in order to pay for the imports. There'd be very little transport or travel needed. Many things would be free from the commons, like the fruit trees in the parks. There'd be no unemployment. We would make sure everybody had a livelihood. So there'd be far less producing, far less work, and much of what is needed to be produced would be in craft form. You would probably have to work for money only two days a week because much would be coming free from your commons and your consumption living simply would not be very great anyway. The fourth principle is the most important and difficult. There must be transition to new ideas and values. People must come to see the point of living as a high quality of life via living standards that are frugal and self-sufficient. And we must become much less individualistic, selfish and competitive. The point of life must become enjoying it without wanting to become rich. The pursuit of affluence, luxury and wealth it's a dreadful mistake. It has to be abandoned. We have to focus on sufficiency, frugality, cooperation, collectivism, making our town thrive. Now, those values cannot be imposed. They have to come to be willingly, happily adopted because people can see that they make sense. The challenge here is enormous. It's a, an enormous cultural change that we have to make or we will not get through to a sustainable and just world order. The simpler way is not about deprivation and hardship in order to save the planet. It's about liberation from the consumer rat race towards a much higher quality of life for all. There must also be a shift from competing and winning as individuals to the eco-feminist focus on caring, nurturing, collectivism and reproducing social cohesion. The situation will make us do this because if you don't prioritise the good of the town 
then it will not thrive and neither will you. A high quality of life does not depend on winning high income possessions or the GDP. Our new neighbourhood will have abundant leisure resources. We won't want to spend much time and energy on shopping or travel away for holidays because we'll have so many interesting things to do where we live. We could have fun on community working bees making areas like this. This is our Peter Pan area. At present, most neighbourhoods are leisure deserts. There isn't much to do there. So we have to spend a lot of money and energy going to commercially provided leisure or just watching a screen. Imagine living in a suburb crammed with things like this and little firms and farms to visit and lots of artists and craftspeople all within a beautifully gardened landscape. Just going for a walk would be an enjoyable leisure activity. Here are some other interesting things helping to make our place leisure rich. A 50 metre creek dug with a shovel. She's back! Your town's leisure committee would be organising picnics, dances, outings, visiting speakers, mystery tours, and there'd be clubs for music, drama, comedy and other things. There'd be the weekly community concert where anyone could get up and recite their latest poem or the drama group could rehearse a scene. Any suburb has lots of musicians, comedians, poets, jugglers. They don't get much chance to perform at present. Ten minutes on a bike and you'd be in another unique environment. Peter Pan is laughing at you and me. He wants to know how can it be we work so hard to produce and get the things we think we want and yet we could spend most of each day as he does in adventure and play. So you'd be living in a leisure rich town, plenty to do without having to spend money or consume resources. And you see why I never go away for holidays and have never got on an aircraft for leisure. We wouldn't be interested in these resource wasters. Most of the things we need can be produced in very simple ways, for example rainwater runoff could drive water wheels like ours, doing things like recharging batteries. Very small turbines can also do that. The open end of the coiled pipe picks up water, adds to the pressure in the pipe, and you have a pump. Here's a bigger version. We can pipe this methane from biological wastes to the house for cooking and candles. Our two windmills, this one's homemade. Our open fire made from a sheet of tin. The village forge.
paper and paste over a parabolic mould. It's actually a good reading light. Making sprinklers for our low pressure system. What can you do with broken glass? Well, you can make interesting windows. We mostly use hand tools. All these would be about 80 years old. But we have some 12 volt machinery. All homemade and a bit clunky. Homemade metal cutting lathe. Many things here made from fiberglass. This is a washing machine. Driven by a $10 car fan. Homemade honey. The honey house containing the centrifuge. Here's another way, just scrape the tops off and let the honey drain out on a warm day. Australians on average buy an incredible 14 kilos of new clothes every year. I need to buy almost none. I patch them up and I can wear these every day for a month. Warm bed socks. I'm pretty good at sewing. I specialise in high-end, fashionable, warm winter apparel. Um, but my work is not always appreciated. Look at the perfect jumpers our grand made using this high-tech equipment. Moulds for casting cement. This one made all our structural columns. Our 90 year old sewing machine. Gates from scrap aluminium. Homemade things are sometimes a bit scruffy, like this video, but that's okay. Bush carpentry without using any sawn timber. Here's how to make a strong joint without using any metal. Making lead light windows. The pottery. Homemade pottery wheel. Yeah, we're pretty good at pottery. The earth oven, bread, pies and pizza. These sheets collect rainwater, which is piped down to several tanks. Experimenting with tidal power. These low-tech ways help to make the place leisure rich. Electronic things like games are not likely to take up much of our time. They're far more interesting and productive things to do. IT will be important in science, research and medicine and so on, but not for leisure. In addition to all the artists and craftspeople, your town will have lots of amateur philosophers, historians, biologists and experts and everything else with plenty of time to study their obsessions and eager to teach and debate with you at the community centre. A major benefit of low-tech craft and hobby production is that it's enjoyable. No one likes producing coffee mugs in a factory. They can be made in your neighbourhood by people who just love doing pottery. The average house is far too big and expensive, yet it's easy to build small and effective housing. This is our caretaker cottage, council approved, about 90 square metres, built by one person in six months spare time, 
for about $13,000 in today's money. But Earth is by far the best building material. It's fireproof, it's a good insulator, it's dirt cheap, and you can sculpt very nice forms from it. A house built from Earth can last hundreds of years. The kinds of things you can do with mud. Iran. The Great Mosque in Mali. Mud bricks the most common. Yellow bricks for our feed shed. The rammed earth method. Which made our warm winter sheep house. 50 years ago. But there are several of these in China made 800 years ago. This is our garden shed made from rammed earth brick. The cob technique, two chicken houses we've made. Our visitor's bunkhouse. Now pottery, an English example, thatch roof, and that one was built in 1815. This is the reciprocal roof idea, the beams locked together to form a self-supporting roof. There's the ceiling, waterproof membrane, then soil and grass to form a sod roof, and a skylight on top. There's a real one, nice open space. A village, all sod roofs. But the strongest and cheapest are probably earth vaults and domes. This is how they build without any scaffolding. Just stick the brick on the slope with mud and you can do the same for the dome and then plaster over and that house probably would cost no more than a few hundred dollars in material. So there are many ways we can do housing differently and cheaply. This model illustrates a small earth walled dwelling about 80 square metres floor area that a couple could build guided by a professional who they'd pay by working on his other projects. You could build it for about $8,000 in 2023 and that's about one thirteenth the cost per square metre of building the average Australian house today. Or would you prefer to live here? Or here? Creative activities are very important and you'll have plenty of time for them when you need to work for money only a couple of days a week. Here are some of our hobbies. Yeah, I can see what's going on here. He was sent out to cut the firewood, but he thought he'd have a little drink first. Then the missus comes out and finds him fast asleep. Well, even the dogs can see there's going to be trouble. Cats on the winning side. And over the years we've made quite a few garden pots. Using these simpler craft, hobby and low-tech ways doesn't mean we need to reduce high-tech science and R&D on things that matter.
That's my garden pot. That's a garden pot. And little statues. And then there's the fleet, many of them yet to be finished. This one took about 60 hours to make, listening to the radio, at a cost of almost nothing. What would 60 hours of leisure at theatres or restaurants cost? These are the kind of things we could do instead of working at the office all day. Most people spend about 10 hours a day at work or getting there and back, and the only thing most of them get from it is money. This society has turned work into a form of oppression. We do far more work producing than would be necessary if we had simpler lifestyles and systems, and producing the things we need could and should be enjoyable. Small family firms and co-ops could produce much of what we need in craft ways, leaving only a few things for mass production factories. And another hobby is painting and drawing. This is where they're done. This one's called the center of your universe. A kitchen table. Well, we hope this look at some of our ways indicates how satisfying the simpler way could be. Many books are saying now that our civilization is descending into a time of great troubles. Our systems are not meeting needs at all well. They're enriching the rich 
and trapping many in struggle and poverty, undermining social cohesion, as well as depleting resources and destroying ecosystems. Our argument has been that the basic cause of all this is the pursuit of affluence and growth within an economic system which must have that, and we cannot solve the big problems unless we shift to some kind of simpler way. This would not be about accepting deprivation and hardship in order to save the planet. It would be a delightful liberation. The best way you can contribute is just by referring to these ideas whenever possible. We cannot make the transition unless and until large numbers of people come to see that it's essential. There's a rapidly increasing shift in this direction now, evident in eco-village, degrowth, transition towns and other movements. So take every opportunity to introduce this perspective and join groups like Community Gardens and make sure their main purpose is to introduce people to these ideas. This one's called Where You Could Be. There's your little mud brick house and garden. There's the community centre in the village. The village green with a fair on it at the moment. Across the river there's the couple of the little farms that supply the town. Down the valley there are other little communities and in the distance half an hour away by train there'll be a small city with industry and hospitals and museums and that's where you could be.